holy, holy, holy. Thank you, my goodness, man. I tell you, that's a powerful, powerful, powerful. And I'm so glad the Lord blesses us with great people to lead us and do wonderful things. And whew, praise the Lord. I'm about out of breath. I think. You got to be in shape to praise the Lord <laughs> with all your might, you know? We read about David. David said, I praise the Lord with all my might. And I'm thinking, boy, he must have been in shape because I'm telling you, it really will take it out of you. All right, we are in a, we're in a study. This is actually the last message of this study that we've been in for the past, uh, well, we've, it, it, for four weeks, uh, excluding Easter, obviously. Uh, uh, four messages out of um, Isaiah 35, which is a messianic chapter, uh, several messianic chapters, uh, especially sections of Isaiah. Isaiah tells us more about Jesus than any other prophet. And much of what we know about Jesus and what we think about Jesus, especially around his crucifixion and other times like that, we didn't learn from the Gospels. We learned them from Isaiah. And, um, and, and he just says a tremendous amount, it gives us a tremendous amount of information. And I, I think the reason why is because uh, God knew we would need it. Now, you know, I, I always hate to be kind of a Debbie Downer about the days we live in, but uh, anybody that's living in them uh, really doesn't, need, doesn't have to be told about them because they just seem to be just spinning out of control, just wild and woolly, just every day you get up thinking, it couldn't be worse, and then it, it is. And, you know, and if you didn't have some assurance that, that God had things in control, I, I don't know how you would deal with this. I, it, it would be so frightening and so, uh, so uh, anxiety, so much anxiety produced in it. It's just, it would be fearful days. So about 30% of your Bible uh, is, is, a, is prophecy. And most of it is end time prophecy. And, and the reason why is because God wants us to know what's going to happen. How, how are we going to make it through? What what will happen to us? What will happen to our country? What, what, what about our children and, and, and our lives and livelihoods and all those kind of things? And so the Lord wanted us to know what provisions he had made for us and what we need to do about what's going on and how we need to, to, to understand and live through these things. And so chapters like Isaiah 35, chapters like Isaiah 53, Isaiah 1, you know, I mean, just all over the book and, and, and many of the other prophets, not just Isaiah, he just kind of happens to be the major one about it, but all, all the prophets. And they, and they said, listen, this is what you need to understand. One of these days, a Messiah is coming. And when that Messiah comes, he's going to bring with him some benefits. And these benefits are going to be for you and for your children and your children's children. And these are going to, these are going to strengthen you. These are going to be used to make a difference in you in these terrible, desert, dry, wilderness, catastrophe days that will be called the end times. And so he, he wrote to us about this, and this chapter 35 is, is the entire chapter is, is this. And there were four benefits, and you remember as we've looked at them, the first one was strength. The Lord gives us strength in these last days. The Messiah brought strength with him. And there were three basic little simple ways that God strengthens us. It talked about our hands, it talked about our knees, and it talked about our fearful heart. And I said, what God gives us is worship, prayer and the word to strengthen our heart. The second week was about um, signs that when the Messiah comes, he was going to work miracles. He was a miracle working signs and wonders Messiah. And that God would use signs. God would use miracles. God would uh, uh, accomplish his purpose and speak to us about our purpose and our lives through miraculous things many times. And that signs and wonders would be a, a part of the last day work of the Holy Spirit. And then the third thing, last week, we learned about streams, that God brought streams into the desert and pools of water like giant lakes into the desert, into the dry old barren desert. And reeds and rushes grew up where jackals used to make their home. And, and, and he's talking about 
uh, the refreshing power of his Holy Spirit that comes into our life and blows into us, through us, and out of us, and brings, and, and, and brings vitality, revival, freshness, life, direction in the midst of our dry, dry times in life. And today we look at the last one, and we're going to talk about streets, all right? So I know that's a little cutie, you know, alliterated S, 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 uh, strength, signs, streams, and streets. Preachers, I don't know why we do that. Uh, I, like I said last week, I think it's because it helps you learn better. I don't think it does, but we still do it. All right, Isaiah 35, <laughs> Isaiah 35. Let's re just read it, read it all, verse 1. The wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. Now, by the way, that's a natural uh, happening, and, 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 and that's what happened in Israel, May 14, 1948. From that time forward, they have been a rose in a desert over there. Um, the United States and Israel are, are, are the only two countries in the world that I know anything about that can actually feed themselves. And not only feed themselves, but export food for others so that others can be fed. And we learn also water from Israel. It's amazing. So this, this has a natural fulfillment and a spiritual fulfillment. Uh, verse 2, it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice, even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon, which back then Lebanon was not a country, it was a land. It was, it was part of Canaan, which is the promised land. Now it's a country, but the glory of Lebanon shall be given to it. The excellence of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the excellency of our God. Here comes strength. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are fearful hearted, be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Here come the signs. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. And the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb will sing. Here come our streams. For water shall burst forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. In the habitation of jackals, where each lay, there shall be grass with reeds and rushes. Here comes the streets. A highway shall be there and a road, and it shall be called the highway of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for others. Whoever walks the road, although a fool, shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast go up on it. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy on their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Whoo! That, that's an amen, right? <laughs> amen. And, and they shall obtain joy and gladness, and, and sorrow and sighing flee away. Boy, that's a, that's a word from God right there, I'll tell you. And that's, what, and that's what Isaiah said 700 years before Jesus came, the Messiah was going to bring with him. All of these benefits. So let's, talk, let's look at three truths about this highway of holiness. I love that phrase, by the way, don't you? And it shall be a highway of holiness. <laughs> well, that's just so nice. All right, first, first truth. It's a highway of grace. The highway of holiness is a highway of grace. So what does God do in these last days to help us through our dry desert, to help us through our hard times? He gives us a highway to walk on that is a highway of grace. When I first read verse 8 about this highway of holiness that the unclean can't walk on it, uh, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I felt a little twinge of condemnation. <laughs> you know, when I read about that and I read things like that in the Bible and the Scripture about how God is a holy God and, 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 and you walk with him and, and, with, and he cleans you and washes you and makes you white as snow and, and you hear about all of those great things like that, uh, 
sometimes, I don't know about you, but I, I, I get just a, a little twinge of condemnation. I mean, I know I'm saved. Don't get me wrong. I, I know that I'm saved by the grace of God. And I know that my sins have been forgiven me, all of my sins, not just part of them, but all of them. And I know that Isaiah even says that, uh, come let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as crimson, they shall be as wool. Though they be red, they shall be white as snow. So I know God has washed me. And I know, like Bertha Smith used to say, she was a, a revivalist, uh, she used to make the statement, she said, and God took your sins and threw them in the sea of forgetfulness, and God posted a no fishing sign, so they'll never be brought up again, nobody will ever revive them again, and, and, and I know that, but sometimes when I, when I read the Bible, the enemy attacks me. Does anybody else have that kind of issue that goes on ever when you're reading the scripture? Somehow the enemy just takes that opportunity to jump in there and bring a little thought of condemnation or guilt or shame or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. Well, if, it, if that ever happens to you, you're in good company. And so am I. Because when Jesus was in the wilderness praying and fasting, that was one of the things that happened to him. Satan was attacking Jesus while Jesus was in the wilderness praying and fasting. And so if you feel any condemnation at all, one thing you can know, and that is that that condemnation does not come from God. In Romans 8, the first verse of Romans 8, what does Romans uh, uh, 7 end with? You know, Romans 7, Paul saying, that stuff I, I want to do, I don't do. That stuff I don't want to do, that's what I find myself doing. And then he ends with, oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from this body of death? And then the first verse of chapter 8 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who walk with Christ Jesus and not after the flesh. So Paul says there's no condemnation to children of God. And then Jesus backs that up in John, or the New Testament does, backs it up in John chapter 3, the most famous verse Everybody knows, even lost people know, is what? For God so loved the world, verse 3, chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Do you know what the next verse says? Verse 17 says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So as soon as I saw this word holiness, I thought, uh-oh, I'm in trouble now. And it gets worse. It goes on to say that the unclean shall not pass over it. And I thought, yep, um, that's talking about me again. <laughs> then it continues. But it shall be for others. The unclean aren't going to get to walk on it. But it's going to be for others. And then I start thinking, yeah, you know what I was talking about? People like Tanya. Yeah, yeah, people that, people that have never even jaywalked in their life. You know, that, that's who it's talking about. Like me, I, I came to the Lord when I was 16. Tanya came to the Lord when she was 11. Now, what, do you, what, what is it you have to give up when you're 11 years old? I mean, what, what, could, what could be so horrible going on in your life that God would have to save you out of something when you're 11 years old? See, I was old enough to get in trouble. I was surely, I was headed for a life of crime that surely involved jail and other things like that. No doubt in my mind, God saved Tanya from what? Uh, bubble gum, something, something like that. <laughs> God delivered me from my bubble gum addiction. But the next line, I got a little encouragement from because I thought, hey, I made it. Whoever walks the road, although a fool, shall not go astray. <laughs> Praise the Lord, I got included in this thing. But what that's talking about, just so you'll know, what, this, what it's really saying is no matter how simple-minded you are, no matter how uh, misgiven you are, if, when you get on the road, uh, you're not going to fall off of it. That, that's really what it's saying. But I thought, oh, praise God, you know, I got it. And then it hit me that I didn't get on this road because of my works. I didn't get on the road because of, uh, uh, that I was clean. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't get on the highway of holiness because I was holy. That 
the reason I got on the highway is because God made a way in the wilderness for me. And that way has a name. And his name is Jesus. And the reason I'm on the highway to holiness is because of Jesus. Our God is a gracious God. The Bible is filled with this. God forgives us. God pardons us. God gives us what we don't deserve, which is what grace is. Mercy keeps us from getting what we deserve, which is we deserve hell because we have sinned against God. And, and mercy keeps me from getting what I deserve, but grace gives me something I don't deserve. I don't deserve to go to heaven. I don't deserve to be filled with God's Holy Spirit. I don't deserve to be clean, but God gives his grace so that the unclean can be made clean, and I'm clean because of his grace. It, you know, I wrote in your handout, if you, if, you, if you had it, I'm not clean because I've had a good week, and I find myself in the good graces of God. I'm not, I, I, or if I had a bad week, I would find myself in the bad graces of God. No, grace is not bad. Grace is always good. And God gives me this grace in spite of myself because I have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. The unclean shall not pass over it. I don't, I'm not unclean. I've been made clean by the blood of Jesus. So I get to walk on that highway of holiness. Now, am I, am I going to have to, look, let me ask you, am I going to have to walk like on the, on the um, what is it, the, the, the side of the highway? The, the what? Berm. Berm of the highway, is that what you're saying? Yeah. yeah, that's a good word. Anyway, we don't have any around here, that's why I don't know what to call them. <laughs> if you've ever noticed them, any of these roads, they, had, they have a ditch, you know, right, right off the road, no, nothing to walk on. But, I, I mean, am I going to have to walk like where the briars and, the, you know, and, the, and the weeds and stuff grow? And, you know, everybody's walking down the road, I, but I'm, I'm not real clean, so I got to walk by, beside the road and the briars and the stickers and all that. And uh, maybe I could hold Tanya's hand while she walks down the road, but I'm going to have to walk over here <laughs> in the briars and stickers. No, no, I get to walk on the road too. <laughs> Why? Because of the grace of God. I am made clean, not by myself, not by my good stuff, not because I'm a wonderful person, but because of his grace. And he says, when the Messiah comes, there's going to be a highway of holiness in the wilderness, and you're going to be able to get on it and walk on it because of the blood of Jesus and the grace of God. Now, there's a wonderful picture of this in the New Testament when a, man, when a Gentile man named Cornelius gets saved. Cornelius is a Gentile man, and of course, the Jews have had the Messiah come to them, and many of the Jewish people, this is in the book of Acts, have come to the Lord, and they've become Christians. Well, no Gentiles have, though, because the gospel hasn't been carried to the Gentiles yet. And so, there is a man named Cornelius who is a Gentile, and he's praying to God, He's a God-fearing man, and he gives alms to the poor, and he just, he's, he's gracious and he's kind, and he's asking God for, for what he needs to do to, to be saved and, and to know him personally. And God speaks to the apostle Peter. This is in Acts 10, by the way. Speaks to the apostle Peter and says to Peter, um, I want you to go up to Cornelius' house. Now, everybody knows Cornelius is a Gentile. Of course, Peter's a Jew. And Peter puts up the argument about be, the, the Gentiles being unclean. And, God, and, and then he goes up on the roof of his house, and he's up there praying. And while he's up there praying, God sends him a vision. And it's, this, it, it's a vision of a sheet, a giant sheet coming down out of heaven. And on this sheet are all kinds of unclean animals. Pigs are there. You know, that's where bacon comes from. <laughs> Shrimp are there. Ooh. Crawfish on it. Lobster. Snow crabs. Uh, uh, catfish. All that on there. Unclean. All the stuff I like. And he lets it down in front of him. And here's what Peter says. This is Acts 10, verse 13. And a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, 
for I've never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time, what God has cleansed you must not call common. This was done three times and the object was taken up into heaven again. So Peter goes to Cornelius' house and he's sitting there explaining to the Gentiles what just happened. In verse 28, then he said to them, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation? But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. And then about five chapters later, there's this big council meeting. A lot of Jewish Christians there. And here's what they're having to decide. What are we going to do with these Gentiles? I mean, these Gentiles that have come to the Lord, and now they're Christians like us. So what are we go what's going to be our stance on this? Are we going to uh, require them to do everything that we had to do with the law and the sacrifices and put them through everything we had to go through or, or, or how we're going to handle it. And, here, and, and this is Peter. Peter says in verse 8, Acts 15, 8 and 9, So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did us and made no distinction between us and them, purifying or cleansing their hearts by faith. So it is... The highway of holiness is a highway where the clean walk and we're made clean not by who we are, what we've done, when we did it, but by what he's already done and his blood that has washed us clean and, and, and gives us the opportunity to walk in, on a holy life. And, and the highway of holiness helps us as we walk through this crazy, barren, dry desert that we're in, especially in these days. Second truth about it, it's a highway of safety. You're safe on the highway. Look at verse nine. Verse nine, Isaiah 35. Uh, no lion... Now, that's not talking about the lion of Judah, by the way. That's talking, that's talking about the roaring lion, you know. It's talking about the adversary, the devil, like a roaring lion walks about seeking those whom he may devour. No lion, it says, shall be there. No lion on, on the road of holiness, highway of holiness. Nor shall any ravenous beast go up on it. It shall not be found there. So there's not going to be any wild beasts and there's not going to be a roaring lion but the redeemed shall walk there. Now, just to show you that this is common with God's nature and other places where God has talked to us about our authority over the enemy of our soul and the fact that he has given us strength and blessed us not to, not to be attacked and damaged by our enemy, but he's given us the power to overcome this. Let me just show you a couple of verses. Psalm 91, verse 13. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Then Jesus backs that up in the New Testament. Luke, 9, Luke 10, verse 19. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. So there's not going to be a lion there, and there's not going to be any ravenous beast on the road. But the implication to us is whatever you do, don't wander off the road. Now, I'm not talking about wandering off the road to be lost again. You know, lots of people feel like, hey, if I don't stay on the straight and narrow, then, you know, I get out here in the weeds somewhere, then I don't belong to God anymore. As if somehow we belong to him when we do good stuff and we don't belong to him anymore when we do bad stuff. So I'm not talking about don't wander off the road as if you're going to be lost again. But remember... Right off the edge of the road, the lion is roaming about to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. And the ravenous beasts are off the side of the road. This verse says they're not on the road. As long as you stay on the road, you don't encounter any of them. But if you wander off of the edge of the road, then that's enemy territory. You know, we live in a fallen world. We live in a world that is filled with evil. And, and, and we get continually tempted by the enemy. I mean, the enemy attacked Jesus, so, you know, don't feel like he's not going to attack you. And there are temptations everywhere. 
And that's why the Apostle Paul told us that in Ephesians 6 that we have to put every day on the whole armor of God, the helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, girdle of truth, you know, uh, shield of faith, sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, feet uh, shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And we have to walk this way because we walk in a very evil, tempting, dangerous world. But the highway of holiness doesn't have any beast on it. It's a safe place for us to be. Jesus, why did Jesus teach us to pray in the Lord's Prayer? Or that's what we call it, the model prayer. Remember it toward the end. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. Or in Matthew, forgive us our debts as we forgive our trespassers or debtors. And then the next line says what? And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from, the ev from evil, or many translations says from the evil one. So what I'm saying here is I, I don't want you to think that just because there's no lion on the highway of holiness that you're safe from being tempted in this life. We all face temptation. This is a fallen world. And when you feel that the enemy is pressing in on you and you feel that the enemy is trying to take advantage of your pain and your vulnerability, uh, let me just suggest a passage that should help you in life. The Apostle Paul in, in, was in prison, about to face death. The last letter that he wrote while he was here on this earth is 2 Timothy. And in 2 Timothy chapter 4, which is the last chapter, the Apostle Paul was talking to Timothy about the faithfulness of the Lord and how faithful God was. And he wrote him in one, some of the last words that the Apostle ever wrote on this earth are, are these, 2 Timothy 4 verse 17. When you, feel, now, when you feel that you are being pressed in by the enemy, you feel like the enemy is taking advantage of you. You feel like that you're vulnerable in some areas and he's pushing on those areas that you are vulnerable in. That's what a good enemy does. A good enemy attacks your weaknesses, not your strengths. We wouldn't expect the enemy to, to attack our strengths, but to attack our weaknesses. And listen to what the Apostle Paul has to say, and this is what God is saying to you. All right, here it is, verse 17. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion and the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever, amen. Now I know we all have the tendency to think that God protects special people. Oh, pastor, I know God would protect you because you're a preacher and you stand up and you proclaim the word. So he's gonna protect you so that the message can go forth. But do you know that you are just as valuable to God as anybody else on this earth, that God doesn't have favorites that he protects and people that he's disappointed in that he allows to be attacked? No, God loves us. God wants us to be successful. God wants us to accomplish the purpose that he created. He doesn't want us to be destroyed and, 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 and picked on and ridiculed and, 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 uh, and, and have a hard time with the enemy. So he tells us, look, I'm gonna be with you. I'm gonna pull you out of the mouth of the lion. I'm gonna deliver you from every evil, evil work and I'm gonna preserve you. So the highway is a highway of grace. It's a highway of safety. And then one other truth about it. This, I like this one. It's a highway of joy. Yeah, a highway of joy. You don't see a lot of joy nowadays, do you? Just temporary stuff. When's the last time you saw somebody look like they really enjoyed life? Probably it's been a while. Joy. In verse 10, it says, in Isaiah 35, verse 10, it says, and the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy on their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing 
shall flee away. Does that, does any of those words or any of those combination of words, does that sound familiar to anybody here? Depending on how old you are and what kind of church you went to and how often you went to that church, when I read that verse, of course I know I'm pretty old and I've probably been in church more than most people in his lifetime and been around a lot of revivals and crusades and all that kind of stuff. So I probably heard this and you probably haven't heard it. But when I read that verse in verse 10, and the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, with everlasting, a tune popped into my head. And I, and I, all this past week, I've been walking around humming and, 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 and singing at, at this tune that I, I, I remembered. And I, I want to share it with you because I, I think it can help. When you're battered down and beaten down and, and there's no joy, there's no encouragement in your life, it, it, might, be, it might be just a, a, a little antidote for to, to break that off of you and to give you just a little flicker and initiate just a little joy in you when you hear this little tune. Hopefully I can give you this little tune when you hear it. Now, I'm going to go to Isaiah 51. We're going to put it on the screen. There it is. Now, this is Isaiah 51. Remember, we just read Isaiah 35, verse 10. This is basically the same words, just written in a little bit different fashion. By the way, this is the old King James language, which is what I grew up with and what I started preaching with. And all the verses that I've memorized, I've memorized in the old King James version of the Bible. And this is, this is the verse in the old King James. It says, therefore, the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion. An everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. So here's, the, and here was a little tune. It, it was going, uh, let's see. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return. You ever heard it? And come to Zion with singing and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. Then you repeat it. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. Now you get the last part. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. An everlasting joy shall be upon their head. Now that, you know, that's a, that's a worship song written in the late 1800s. That song went in rallies uh, with Mr. Moody and, uh, and uh, a lot of the old uh, Billy Sunday, all of the old rompers and stompers and stuff like that. This was a, one of their worship songs. And all it is is obviously the verse here in Isaiah 51. And, it, and, it, and when the enemy jumps on you, when the enemy wants to put you down, when he wants to take advantage of you, one of the things that happens is immediately you begin to get pushed down in life. You begin to go into sorrow or mourning. What did, what did Jesus say in the Beatitudes about this? Matthew 5, you remember? Blessed, blessed, blessed. He said, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. So God says, when you are mourning, and you know, I, maybe I just need to say this for somebody who's listening up here or, or in here, I don't know. I just feel compelled to say this, that many people, especially these days that we're in right now, I don't know if they've experienced some great loss in life or some great hurt in life, but the enemy takes advantage of that. And he just rolls in 
morning. It's, like, it's almost like a wave that just rolls in. And when it, when, and when it rolls in, it just it, it puts you under a, 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 a cloud, a, a, a dryness, a, a harshness, and, and, and you begin to roll this over and over, and he just uses it to torment you and torture you in life. Now, when that happens to you, that has to be broken. Now, it doesn't have to go through some big uh, uh, shenanigans to break this thing. All you have to do is take the word of God and you can break this thing off of yourself. And that's why I wanted to share with you the little song. Therefore, the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. An everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain. <laughs> anyway, if you can remember even anything like that, that's the word of God. That's all that is, is just simply a melody of the word. And, and that might be just the tool that you need to use to break this mourning, this sorrow, <laughs> this, this sadness off of your life because God says he's going to give you tools. If you're mourning, he's going to give you tools to break that off of your life. And, and that might be just what you need. All right, let me finish with this question. And I, I want you to listen. I'm going to tell you in advance this is a trick question. All right? I'm going to set you up with this question, and it's a trick question. So don't answer. Just let it be rhetorical, all right? Because I, I don't want anybody to get mad because I say, no, your answer is not right. All right, so I'm telling you in advance. Luke 15. All right, here's the question. Why don't people rejoice more than they do? I mean, the Scripture tells us over and over to rejoice in the Lord always, and again, I say rejoice. He gives us lots of verses that, have, that indicate that we're to be filled with joy and that, uh, that he'll comfort us when we mourn and, and that we should, we should rejoice in the Lord. So why don't we rejoice more than we do? Well, I'm gonna go to Luke chapter 15 and we're gonna put some scriptures up here and I, I want you to see what they say. In Luke chapter 15, there are three in Luke chapter 15, there are three lost things. There is a lost sheep, there is a lost coin, and there is a lost boy. In every instance, Luke 15 is teaching how to rejoice for the right reason. In every one of these parables, the point of the parable is to rejoice for the right reason. When the lost are found, you rejoice. Now, the first one is a shepherd. He has lost his, he's, he's has a hundred sheep and he has lost one and he leaves the 99 and he goes to search for the lost one and verse six says, and when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, which was lost. The next one is a woman, and this woman has 10 coins. And she loses one of her 10 coins, and she begins to search diligently. I mean, she even sweeps her house. She searches for this coin. And when she found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the piece which I lost. And then the last story is about a father who has two sons. And one of the sons comes to him, the youngest, and says, Father, give me my inheritance. And he leaves father's house and he goes away. And his father thinks he's never going to see him again. He thinks the boy is gone forever. And he hears stories about how the boy is wasting all the resources and riotous living and he's praying for his boy. And then finally, one day, out of the blue, his, his lost boy, the boy he thought he would never see again, comes walking up the road to the house. And, and verse 23, and when the father saw him, he said, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. So, 
What's the first thing they did when they found what they were looking for? Now, I've set you up to say rejoice, right? Wrong. The first thing they did was to stop looking for that which was lost. How many times have you said it? It'll probably be in the last place I look. Well, of course it is. I mean, I certainly hope you don't keep looking once you found it, right? Certainly it's going to be in the last place you look. So, yeah, right. So, yeah, you find it. So the first thing that anyone does when something is lost and they find it is they stop looking for it. The second thing they do is rejoice. Now, you might be saying, so what's your point? I mean, why that? That's just a little tricky shenanigans with words there. But it's really not. Because remember, the, the, the original question is, why don't people rejoice more than they do? The reason people don't rejoice more than they do is because they're still looking for something in their life that's lost. You see, we're all born sinners, right? Every one of us. The Bible tells us in, in Romans 3.10, for there is none righteous, no, not one. And then in verse 23 of Romans 3, it tells us the reason, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So our whole life is a quest to fill up this God-shaped God vacuum that we have in our life. Only God can fill it. But we spend our life looking for all kinds of things that, can, that we hope can fill up this empty spot in our life. We search for love. We search for acceptance. We search for forgiveness. We search for, uh, for purity. We search for all kinds of things that we sense need to be in this God-shaped vacuum in our life. But until it's filled with Christ, you will never quit looking. So you can never rejoice until you quit looking. And you can't quit looking until it's filled with Jesus Christ. So we're constantly looking for it. But we don't find favor with God by doing good stuff. We don't find favor with God by doing uh, clean stuff and nice stuff and wonderful stuff. We find Christ because Christ is a way in the wilderness. And God shows us this and the Messiah brings us this. And we find Christ because God washes us with his blood and we are, and we are covered by the grace of God. So bow your head with me for just one